Go well, team. Welcome for those who are joining us. Thanks so much for joining. Nice to see some names I'm not familiar with. Anne, Eliza, one, Leslie, Liz. Lovely to you all to join us. Thanks so much. Welcome, Margaret, Sophie. Great that you can join us, Zoe. Thank you all. We're going to give people probably about two minutes um, to join us and then we'll get started. Hello to those who have just recently joined. I was just saying um, we're going to give it about one more minute or so, uh, let as many people as possible join, and then we'll get started. It's always interesting with these um, this format where you can't actually talk to people as they're joining, but it's really fabulous that you can all make the time um, in your evening to, to join us for this. Thank you. Thank you for the hands up. Is that a hello? <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> As I was saying, yeah, I think we'll give it about, an, oh, loads of hands up, excellent. Um, we'll give it one more minute and then we will jump in. Um, and just from a practical point of view, we will be recording this um, because there's uh, some of our supporters that would love to attend but aren't able to. Well, thank you for you who have already started what I was just about to um, say, that there's a Q&A bar down the bottom. Please pop any questions or if you just want to say hello there, that would be great. Um, we will have three speakers tonight and there'll be a Q&A at the end, but feel free to put any questions as we go. Um, and my colleagues or I will answer you as we go and also in the Q&A section at the end. Okay, it looks like we have a good number on now. So we will get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Kelly Nichols. I'm the Director of Strategy, Fundraising and Communications at the Refugee Council. And we really, really appreciate you taking this time in your very busy schedules to join us. I wanted to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands that we're all calling in today and pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. Uh, we wanted to bring you this session because we really wanted to share with you the situation facing around 15,000 people seeking asylum who are living right here in our communities. These are children, families, the elderly, people with disabilities, and they're facing a situation where the, they can't provide the, their family adequate food. Some children are, going, are actually suffering malnourishment. There's homelessness, illness, 
physical and mental and the inability to pay for medications that they need. And that's happening right here in our communities where we live. And I think sadly, it's a situation that very few people are aware of. So we wanted to share with you more information about that. It's a top um, priority for the Refugee Council and something that we are working on really hard. And we wanted to share with you also what we're doing um, and kind of lift the lid on the work that we're doing about that and also ways that you can help and you can be involved. Uh, there'll be three speakers today, as I said, and then at the end, there'll be a Q&A session. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll be recording it because we had a number of supporters who would really love to be here but aren't able to. Uh, as we go, feel free to pop any, any questions in the Q&A or any comments and we'll answer you as well as we go. Um, so to get started, I'll hand you over to my colleague, Director of Policy and Research at the Refugee Council, Rebecca Eckard. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm going to share an overview of why we need a safety net for people seeking our protection. So the federal program to support people seeking asylum during the protection application process is called the Status Resolution Support Service, or SRSS. So if you hear us talk about the SRSS program, that's what it is. I'll try to say the Status Resolution Program as well, just to help you uh, remember what it means. This program has been cut drastically over the past eight years. There are narrow eligibility criteria that mean very few people actually can qualify for financial support. And it also means that thousands of people who have sought Australia's protection are now living in deep poverty, facing homelessness and hunger. So who are we talking about? There are approximately 70,000 people who have sought refugee protection in Australia and are waiting for a decision. It is primarily people who arrived by plane on a prior visa and then sought protection, but there are still um, a few thousand people who arrived by boat in either 2011, 2012, or 2013 and are still waiting for their first decision. Of the 70,000 people waiting, the vast majority do not require financial assistance, as many people want to and can work to support themselves. For those that do need some help, there are approximately 15,000 people in Australia, including children, the elderly, and people with disabilities that need a basic safety net to help them survive while they wait for a decision. I'll give you a quick snapshot of the current situation. So the SRSS program, that status resolution program, offers minimal but still vital assistance. It's approximately $42 to $45 a day, um, and it is the successor to the support program for people seeking asylum first introduced by the Howard government in 2006. The program provides a basic living allowance and that is capped at 89% of the job seeker rate. So people cannot even receive the basic job seeker rate. It's capped at 89% and many people actually receive less than that. There is some very limited casework support and sometimes access to torture and trauma counseling. The support program has been cut by 95%. The cuts began in 2017 with then Minister uh, Peter Dutton declaring that it was not a welfare program and they then applied a more restrictive eligibility criteria in order to qualify for support. The program went from a budget of $300 million in 2015 to just $15 million this, this year, this financial year. The number of people assisted has dropped from more than 29,000 people in 2015 to just 1,600 now. We've heard from the Home Affairs Department that the drop in people on the program is because it is a changing group of people, a changing cohort, they say. But we think it's actually quite disingenuous because that is only a small portion of the full picture. The greatest change came from the deliberate restrictions that were put in place in 2017. The program benefits very few people, but has a high administrative burden. So what does that mean? I'll give you an example of a woman who was working, she was supporting herself, and then she sudden became, suddenly became very unwell and ended up losing sight in one of her eyes and her remaining vision was also compromised. She had to navigate the complex status resolution application on her own and was required to have documentation from four different medical clinicians. Arranging and traveling to all those appointments, plus the cost of paying for them, was a huge barrier for her and took months to complete. She was not eligible for the support program while she was arranging for all of the evidence that is required. 
Sadly, we often see this clinical expert evidence ignored or not considered in decision-making for getting onto the support program. The cuts also undermine people's efforts to apply for a visa or to depart the country. The Howard government's original program was introduced because the destitution among people seeking asylum left many people locked in a battle for survival each day, so much so that they were not well enough to engage effectively in the visa process. Today, with much of the safety net removed, we are seeing the same issue again. Few people transition smoothly after they get the grant of their permanent visa or voluntarily depart when their visa applications are rejected. We know that state governments and local governments have specifically set up programs to provide short-term assistance to fill the gap created by the federal government's cuts, but they are now all progressively withdrawing, citing that it is the role of the federal government to provide this support. Some support has already finished and all others are set to end in June. The lengthy delays in visa processing in our messy system have made the situation much worse. So there's currently a two year average wait for your first decision, the initial decision from the department and over seven years for a merits review at the tribunal. So this means that many people are waiting nine years without access to a safety net for a final resolution of their protection application. We know that charities and community groups, our members have been supporting people but cannot meet the intense and increased need. The demand for help far outstrips what charities have been able to provide. So some of the greatest areas of need are housing. Um, we've heard from some people who are spending $550 per week um, to live in uh, an apartment in Sydney, but the family sleeps in the hallway because the bedrooms have such big holes in the wall that rats have destroyed the rooms. There are rat droppings covering the floor and all of the items inside the room. And the children um, who live there who are studying for HEX, their textbooks have been chewed to pieces by the rats. In terms of other issues that we know um, people are experiencing, their health needs aren't being met. So people seeking refugee protection with no safety net struggle to fill their vital prescriptions or to get urgent care when they experience accidents. Um, one example was of um, a child from an asylum seeking family was playing and climbing and fell and broke his leg. His parents were so panicked because they didn't have ambulance cover and were terrified of the thousands of dollars that the bill would result if someone called an ambulance so they called an Uber to try to transport them to the hospital. The Uber driver was horrified and they had to negotiate with the Uber driver to agree to go to the hospital because they knew that if an ambulance was called, they would have to choose between rent, food or paying the ambulance bill. We also know that manageable conditions like diabetes have been exacerbated because people cannot pay for their insulin and either dilute their insulin or go for days without injection, injections. In one instance, a man experienced such severe damage to his kidneys that he required dialysis. So people seeking asylum experience preventable complications as a result of not having enough money for their medication. We also, as, as uh, Kelly had indicated, have heard about food scarcity and people not having enough food. Um, we heard directly from parents who were contacted by their children's schools because of unacceptable attendance rates by the children. The mom explained to us that she felt so guilty sending the kids to school with nothing in their lunch boxes that she thought it would be better that they not go. Another parent admitted to encouraging her children to go back to bed in the morning because she didn't have enough food for their breakfast. The result has been that the Royal Children's Hospital and other community health have been treating asylum seeking children for malnutrition and the associated developmental delays that are created by that. So we will share shortly our call to action to address this dire situation and to help people who have sought our protection to be able to live safely within our communities. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm sure you all share my sentiment of like how shocking it is, these stories that happening right here in our communities, it's really shocking. Um, I now hand you over to Yasser Nasseri, who's one of Refugee Council's National Refugee Ambassadors in our face-to-face -face program. Um, Yasser will share his incredible story of escaping his homeland of Iran, uh, traveling halfway around the world to Indonesia, and then his absolute treacherous journey to seek asylum in Australia. But he'll also share 
um, from his personal experience, what's possible when people seeking asylum actually receive the support that they need um, and what, how that's changed his life. Uh, Yasser currently works as a marketing activation lead at West Farmer and is a passionate speaker and advocate for better inclusion of refugees in Australia. Thank you, Yasser. Oh, thank you very much. Um, do you guys hear me? <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, before I begin, I, begin, I also would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today um, on the traditional lands of Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islander people. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and recognize the ongoing connection to the land, sea, and the culture. So uh, uh, she talked about the statistics and some examples, and I'm here to talk about my personal story and uh, as an asylum seeker and a refugee who arrived in Australia in 2014 and um, the advocacy and involvement that I have in this space. And I've watched and observed a lot of uh, difficulties this asylum seeker is going through in a daily basis. So uh, my name is Yasser Nasseri. I'm uh, a refugee from Iran. Um, uh, and here I am going to, to share my, my personal story and my journey and the difficulty I've been going through. I left in uh, Iran in 2011. Uh, I was part of a political movement and there was a big protest back then in 2011 in Iran. And uh, that was uh, heavily suppressed by the government. Uh, unfortunately, one of my friends was shot and he died a few weeks after. And then a lot of other friends were arrested. So as the government was pushing and suppressing heavily the, the protests, uh, it uh, forced the protests to stop. And I know that's the time that Revolutionary Guard come after people, especially I was a Friday's a lot of my friends were arrested and I knew sooner or later uh, they would have to give names of other protesters or friends and the Revolutionary Guard would come after those people, me included. So I was uh, under immense pressure and fear and I had to decide to leave Iran as so many other young people my age in that time had to do. The most accessible for me then was Indonesia, where um, I was promised to be sent to Australia by boat in a few weeks, but the few weeks uh, got a lot longer. I had no idea what I was doing, and I was certain that uh, I had to leave Iran. So I ended up in Indonesia, in Jakarta, hoping that very soon I will leave, and uh, as I was promised by people smuggler, and I go to Australia. Long story short, I had five attempts to take boat. Uh, each time something would happen that um, we couldn't even reach to the boat. I was arrested a few times by the, by immigration officers, and I had to kind of escape um, house to house, city to city. Uh, one time, a smug the people a smuggler took our money, and he was gone, and we lost our money. And so many other uh, these kind of incident happened that we couldn't even. Um, reached to the boat. But finally, after a few months, uh, uh, we uh, got to the boat. And I remember we were about around 250 asylum seekers in December 2011. And we departed from Surabaya, Indonesia, toward Australia. Uh, we were in the middle of Indian Ocean. And unfortunately, because of bad weather and a weak condition of the boat, we sank. And from 250 people, roughly um, kind of 47 survived. Um, and because we were in Indonesian water, um, they sent us back to Indonesia. And I remember I was uh, detained with other few asylum seekers. I was detained in a cell for two months without fresh air. Anyways, there's a lot of details. I don't want to go to, to the details, but uh, I managed to escape and came back to Jakarta from Surabaya and had no option. I knew no one. I was in a new country. I had uh, no connection and no money and my visa was over and I already sank in the ocean. I'm a survivor with a lot of trauma. And the only way I found was UNHCR. So I registered with UNHCR and... Um, it kind of took me three years uh, to get my refugee status and then my visa and then flew into Australia. 
Um, I have lived with a lot of asylum seekers, and in fact, I was one of them. Uh, I exp I've experienced absolute poverty there, a uh, lot of struggles and discrimination. Um, I could not study nor work, uh, which I really wanted, but there was no condition for me to do that. And there was not much support there. Uh, I was counting my days and nights to get my visa and move to a better country where I can finally start my life and uh, where I can access to my human rights and get some support. Uh, one of the examples I always share is that I remember for a few months I was living on instant noodle day and night and uh, I didn't have much money to to access, you know, medicine or uh, doctor or I even remember I got a dengue fever in Indonesia and I really needed the help and an individual helped me to go to hospital. Otherwise, I, uh, I wasn't sure if I would be here today with the dengue fever, but it was a very tough um, situation and I was living uh, in a very poor condition in as an asylum seekers in Indonesia. Anyways, uh, in 2014, I uh, moved to Australia. Uh, I was one of the very rare lucky one who got the visa from UNHCR and I flew in to Australia and I start from absolutely zero. I studied English from scratch and did my uni and on the side, I start doing volunteer work and casual work to kind of until I, I found the full-time work in Best Farmers and now I'm a full-time worker and I kind of uh, established a bit, a bit of life here. Um, so none of these achievements that I have uh, um, kind of got in, in Australia wouldn't be possible without the support uh, which were provided to me since I moved to Australia. I... I had caseworkers, I had access to Medicare, I had access to free English classes, um, even HEX to, that enables me to go to uni or even think about university. And a lot of a scholarship that my PR enables me to, to receive and, and, and a lot of other supports. And uh, I even because of my trauma, I had uh, a lot of access to a lot of trophies that cost me almost none. Um, and um, these are were possible because I had the right visa and I got my PR and I was recognized as a refugee. And since I have arrived in Australia, uh, again, I was continuing living and uh, mentoring a lot of asylum seekers and refugees here in this space. Uh, I'm proud to be able to advocate for them. And as someone who experienced absolute poverty in Indonesia and uh, as an asylum seeker, I could not believe such things would exist in Australia. I thought, you know, um, Indonesia, that would be possible. It is, you know, not signatory to anything, but, you know, in Australia, I wouldn't believe that these things still exist here. Um, Australia as a first world country is that signatory to um, to variety of human rights treaties and agreement. Um, so I have talked to many asylum seekers who are part of these 15,000 that we are talking about and want to support and uh, the difficulty they're going through. Uh, imagine you're escaping persecution, uh, leaving your home country and entering into a new country where you can seek safety and safe heaven, yet you can't even uh, get your basic support and basic human rights, which is uh, really, really sad. There's a lot of examples of asylum seekers that lack support due to their visa condition and government policies Asylum seekers who have no right to work, no access to Medicare, no access to education. In many cases, they become homeless and even struggle for daily meals. A lot of them become depressed and deal with a lot of mental illnesses. In fact, I have a close friend. Uh, actually, I have a lot of them. Uh, but this example, I have a close friend who had to find a casual job because he has struggled. He didn't have any support from government. So he had to do a start working cash. And because of working cash, he was his right was kind of uh, attacked. So he couldn't really claim his right at work, sometimes underpaid, sometimes even no pay. And due to the very tough condition, he got a back pain. And now he's uh, he can't even see a specialist, let alone to go for operation. So there is a lot of cases like that, people who 
are homeless because of lack of support, people who don't have access to Medicare and can't get their basic medicine uh, because of their condition and the visa condition, which is uh, really shocking in, in a kind of a first world country, in Australia. Um, so there are so many cases as such, or even worse. Um, um, I have uh, spoken to so many of them, and I'm sure some of you already have met them or have, have heard the story of them. Um, so here uh, I'm reaching out to, to you for your donations to help Refugee Council of Australia and their advocacy effort to lobby the federal government to provide uh, these 15,000 people with the basic support they urgently need. I believe in. Uh, I believe Australia is better than that. I believe these people do not deserve this unjust condition, and I believe with your support we can change this situation. Thank you so much, and thanks for Refugee Council of Australia for relentless work they have been doing to support asylum seekers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasa. Really, really appreciate your time. I think it was so powerful how you were talking about that you couldn't believe that the kind of poverty that you'd seen in Indonesia could actually be here in Australia. That's really poignant. poignant. It really touched me. Um, and thank you for sharing your incredible story. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I now hand you over to our CEO, Paul Power, who can tell you more about the work that we're doing to try to change the situation, to try to secure a safety net for these people. Also tell you a little bit about the federal budget. Um, and our meetings with government. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thank you, Kelly, uh, uh, for that invitation. And thank you, Yasa, for your comments and for everything that you shared about your own story and about um, your observations of the situations that your friends are experiencing. I uh, also begin by acknowledging that um, I'm speaking uh, and living on unceded Indigenous land, which is, in my case, is the land of the Darawal and Gandango people um, in the outer southwest of Sydney. Uh, just to give you an idea of the sorts of um, work that we've been doing on, on this issue, um, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, this um, cutting of the financial safety net for people seeking asylum has actually been happening uh, since 2016, 2017. Um, and we've been campaigning on this issue uh, since the cuts began. Um, as you could imagine, uh, Peter Dutton, as Home Affairs Minister, as the person responsible for beginning this process of cuts, was quite impervious to any um, advocacy from our organisation and from others. Um, but we certainly uh, spent an enormous amount of time, you know, taking the issue to members of the government, um, of the previous government, um, and uh, and also um, raising concerns with. Uh, the then Labor opposition and with um, the Greens and other crossbenchers. Um, and certainly, you know, we had, you know, more of a listening ear from some people in government, uh, particularly uh, in the last um, 18 months or so of uh, the Morrison government. But unfortunately, none of the changes that were desperately needed uh, were acted on. Um, as part of that process, we actually also gained the support of different members of the then Labor opposition, um, as well as the crossbenchers for, for change. Um, for the work that we've been doing um, has been very much informed by um, our regular contact with people um, who are seeking asylum, um, who, you know, who are in this situation, and also our regular um, teleconferences and meetings with frontline agencies who are part of the, the membership of the Refugee Council of Australia. Um, so we've been, um, we host monthly meetings um, with frontline agencies um, and through those monthly meetings, the uh, scale of the need has actually been very, very clear. And we've of course followed up with um, numerous uh, strategy meetings to uh, gather more information and to develop common approaches to advocacy, you know, which we've been pursuing you know, particularly 20, since 2017. Um, while um, we've struggled um, until the uh, last year's federal election to get a listening ear in Canberra, we've actually also been taking this issue up with state governments around the country. And of course, things hit a crisis point in 2020 when um, the COVID pandemic um, hit and uh, many people who are living on bridging visas who'd been working in part-time and casual work lost their jobs 
virtually overnight. Of course, um, as people will recall, those on temporary visas were excluded from the additional assistance that the Morrison government offered to citizens and to permanent residents. Um, and the need for us to be able to uh, get support from wherever uh, it was possible to get support for asylum seekers was, was greater than ever. Um, th so through our very active involvement um, in networks in Victoria and New South Wales, where, where the more than three quarters of people in this situation are currently living, um, we're able to work with others uh, through the network of asylum seekers, uh, seeker agencies in Victoria, and through the uh, New South Wales Government's Joint Partnership Working Group on Re Refugee Resettlement to get um, support from the state governments in Victoria and New South Wales. Um, and you know, over the past uh, three to four years, both those state governments have contributed um, you know, more than $20 million each towards emergency relief to, to frontline agencies that are trying to assist people uh, who, are, who are experiencing destitution and homelessness. As Rebecca mentioned, that um, support is due to run out on the 30th of June, and so we're working very, very hard um, to encourage this, both uh, the, the Victorian and state and New South Wales governments in particular um, to maintain um, access to emergency relief. And um, we're hopeful that um, there may be some positive news coming out of the Victorian government shortly. The budget was handed down this week, and we're trying to uh, ascertain um, you know what level of support there might be available for asylum seekers over the coming 12 months and in the case of New South Wales um, we are uh, holding a briefing for New South Wales MPs at uh, Parliament House in Sydney on Tuesday evening to draw attention to our appeal to the Treasurer and to the New South Wales Minister for Multiculturalism to continue the funding that the previous government in New South Wales offered to people seeking asylum. In both cases, um, and in the cases of, of uh, some short-term support in other states, the spirit of the funding from state governments was that they were providing stopgap assistance while waiting for change at the federal level. So we also have the capacity to be able to get um, state MPs to lobby their federal labour counterparts um, for change at the federal level. So since the federal election, um, we've uh, had many meetings with MPs, um, in fact, uh, had one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, 22 uh, MPs and senators, um, specifically on, on uh, this topic of support for people seeking asylum and, and also the situation of people who are in temporary protection visas. Um, and we've had numerous discussions with the immigration minister and with ministerial advisors um, and many many hours of discussions with the department of home affairs staff um, about um, the, the current criteria uh, for the status resolution support services program what's quite clear is that the sort of change that's required uh, does not require um, legislative change or policy change or probably doesn't even require um, additional um, allocations within the federal budget because by looking at the federal budget we can see that there's a capacity for uh, funds to be allocated within the um, very very large compliance and detention budget that the Department of Home Affairs has set aside. Unfortunately the federal budget uh, that was released earlier this year also highlighted um, the, the priorities of, of um, you know of the, the federal government currently what it revealed was that in the year which is just about to finish, as Rebecca mentioned, that just $15 million of the $36.9 million that was set aside for the 2022-23 year for direct assistance to asylum seekers has been spent. So less than half of the available funds had actually been spent. Um, and you know, we see that uh, the federal government has notionally allocated um, $37 million for uh, direct assistance um, to people seeking asylum, as well as, uh, you know, there's certainly additional funds available for the support services, um, you know, responsible for administering the program. So there's certainly uh, room within the federal budget for some, some change to begin, um, and, and certainly the capacity for um, an expansion of, of, 
you know, what was a quite effective program in years past. But the question for us, of course, is to, um, to be able to apply the pressure to affect change to the criteria to the program. Um, this week and next week, we're actually involved in around four and a half or five hours of meetings um, discussing uh, with the Department of Home Affairs the, the fine detail of the eligibility criteria for the status resolution support services. I think um, earlier this month, we saw um, you know, the beginnings of some possibility to, to shift the government policy, um, but um, you know, it's it certainly, you know, the work that's required um, uh, is quite detailed. And um, I'm sure that we, you know, we will be spending uh, many, many uh, hours and days of, you know, in um, detailed discussions with the Department of Home Affairs over coming months to try to uh, shift the eligibility criteria. We also need political support um, to ensure that the immigration minister and the federal government um, you know, backs the changes that are required. Uh, as, as I mentioned, it's entirely within the power of the immigration minister uh, to be able to affect this change. And what we need to be able to do is to ensure that the, the minister, Andrew Giles, gives this issue the absolute priority that, that's required. He's certainly aware um, of the concerns of the community sector, um, but we need uh, you know, his support and we also need pressure from other members of the government um, to be able to ensure that this issue is given the, the priority that's required. I mean, one of the issues, of course, is that, uh, you know, there are so many issues within the Home Affairs portfolio for the uh, Albanese government to address. Um, uh, but it's important that uh, this, issue, this issue, this lack of a financial safety net for people seeking asylum is having such a, a uh, an enormous impact in our communities that we actually want to ensure that this um, need for policy change is actually given the highest priority by the Albanese government. Now, in the chat, uh, you will have seen a link to um, a call to action. And so we're asking people to support um, our efforts to raise this issue with uh, federal MPs. Um, you know, quite a number of them are aware of the issue. Um, in fact, and probably um, quite a number of them are operating under on the belief that the issue is being addressed. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, much more work needs to be done and more pressure needs to be applied. So we'd strongly encourage you to join this call to action and um, express your support for the government to uh, shift on um, or to reverse the, the cuts that have happened over this, the last six or seven years uh, to the safety net for people seeking asylum. Um, we uh, and of course um, we need support, you know, from our donors and supporters to be able to continue the work that we're doing. Um, you know, longer time supporters of the Refugee Council would be aware that our organisation has operated without any uh, core government funding since 2014, when Scott Morrison, as Immigration Minister, cut the core funding that our organisation had. Um, We've operated without any government funding for any of our policy and advocacy work since the year following that, 2015. And while most peak bodies working on policy issues um, receive the bulk of their income from government funding, um, we operate uh, without, uh, without funding. And we've learned through bitter experience over the, the 41 or 42 years of the Refugee Council of Australia that um, it's not possible for a community voice on refugee policy to be able to uh, remain viable while relying on uh, federal government support. So we, you know, we really need uh, the financial support of people who are committed to change in refugee policy. Um, and uh, you know, unlike many organisations, our uh, budget, uh, our donations have been impacted by um, uh, a shortfall in, in donations you know, over, or since the beginning of, or since late last year, or since the middle of last year. So we, um, we yeah, we really need your support. We're probably, you know, for the, the current year, about 15% down on the donations required to maintain the work that we're doing. Um, so we, you know, strongly appeal to you to, to do anything you can to support us um, to continue this work, as well as to add your voice to our call to action.
you know, to federal MPs and senators. Um, so, of course, the work that we're doing in relation to um, a financial safety net for people seeking asylum is just one of many issues that we're currently working on. We're also seeking expansion of the humanitarian refugee and humanitarian program. We're advocating for solutions for people affected by the offshore processing policy. We're taking up the cases of individuals in immigration detention. Um, from next month, we will be um, uh, the uh, global NGO co-chair of the Dialogue on Refugee Resettlement as part of our efforts to apply greater pressure on the Australian government to um, expand our approach to, to refugee resettlement. Um, we re are regularly responding to submissions um, on uh, new government legislation and also inquiries on various issues related to refugee settlement and support, as well as supporting refugee-led organisations in national and international advocacy and working with uh, NGOs across the Asia-Pacific region on putting forward ideas as to how Australia could engage more constructively on, on refugee issues within the region. So this issue um, of the financial safety net um, at the moment is um, one of our highest priorities, but of course it's one of many um, that we're currently working on. So um, yeah, so really we appreciate the support that each of you has, has given our organisation over the years, and we strongly encourage you to consider us um, in terms of financial support in, in coming weeks, as well as uh, adding your voice to our efforts to draw um, attention yet again to the need for federal change in the financial safety net that's provided to people seeking asylum. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we'll now open up to any questions for any of the panelists or any thoughts that you wanted to share. If you can just pop those in the Q and A. Um, and while you're doing that, I can let you know some good news is that we've had uh, 12 very generous supporters that have banded together because of, as just exactly what Paul was saying, to create what's called a match gift fund. And the way that works is that between now, we're announcing it today until June 25th, any donation that you give will be doubled. So you give $100 today, you're actually donating $200, you give $500, you're donating $1,000. Um, so this is a really great opportunity for you to actually double your impact. Uh, and my colleague Chloe has popped in the chat the link to do that, to donate. And as I said, from today until June 25th or until we reach 130,000, which is the cap, um, your donations will be doubled. So thank you also for the very generous supporters who, um, who have contributed to that. We really very much appreciate that. Um, and as Paul and Rebecca mentioned, we've also put in the chat a call to action. It's an email your MP. It's very simple to do. My um, friend said it would take, um, it's like a minute or something of your time, um, but it will uh, help your MP become aware of this really important issue. So very much appreciate if you could consider taking those two actions. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? I know my colleague answered there was um, a few that have been answered already, but just if you have any, I'd love to be able to open up so we could talk, but because of the na nature of the um, webinar, that's not possible. So if you have anything that you'd like to pop in the Q&A, that would be great. Otherwise, I'll let everybody go off to dinner, but um, let us know if you have, I'll leave it for a while. There we go. Are there any volunteer opportunities to work with your organization? Ah, thank you. Um, my colleague, I don't know if she's on the call, Rebecca, um, not, not Rebecca Eckard, um, Rebecca Langton is, uh, coordinates that. And if you could email her, I'll get Chloe to pop answer you with her email. So um, Chloe, if you could send her email to this person, sorry, I don't know your name. Um, thank you for offering. Does anybody else have any questions for any of the panelists? Does anyone else have any, while we're giving people just a couple of minutes, does anyone have any final things that you wanted to add? Uh, somebody said, can Paul give us a little more insight into the budget regarding seeking safety? Sure. I mean, what we saw um, in the budget and it's it's uh, outlined in the analysis which we which is on our website and which also we shared with members and supporters earlier in the month is that um, 
the the government has been clearly underspending um, even the uh, funds available um, uh, on the financial safety net for people seeking asylum. As, as I mentioned, the uh, less than half of the $36.9 million, which had been notionally set aside in the 2023 budget, is the 2022-2023 budget um, was actually spent. Um, so, and, and, and the fact that, uh, you know, this financial year just finishing, the federal government expects, in, expects to spend yeah, $15 million, it's a 95% cut um, in direct assistance since 2016-17, which is truly shocking. Um, at a time when the need for the financial safety net has actually grown significantly. Um, the, I think you know, this issue has got a number of elements and, and part of the problem is the fact that um, there's been a real slowdown in the processing of onshore protection visas. Um, and now it's taking um, an average of more than two years for an initial decision on an onshore protection visa, um, or in the past, um, you know, probably 10 or 12 years ago, the majority of applications were dealt with within several months. Um, but then on top of that, if people are rejected at the first, um, at, you know, through the first round of decision making, they have the opportunity to take it to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the delay in um, uh, AAT hearings is now around six or seven years. So somebody who's going through two stages of the onshore protection system can expect to wait um, eight years or more for a decision on their application. And of course, people are left in a situation then where they have no access to a financial safety net if they're not able to um, ensure that they have income. So this is, you know, it's a, an absolutely critical need. Um, so while the federal government has been cutting this vital safety net by 95%, of course, we've seen billions of dollars um, allocated to um, detention and to offshore processing and to um, you know uh, border management and, and in fact in the year just finishing um, the federal government is forecasting that will have spent 611 million dollars on offshore processing just on its programs in Nauru and um, Papua New Guinea to to detain well it's now you know in total uh, less than 120 people um, so um, certainly, if you look at where where the government's priorities are, um, sadly, you know nothing has changed since the change of government in relation to you know huge focus on spending on offshore processing and you know failing to address the the financial safety net. I mean, and and of course, you know what we saw in opposition was that Labor MPs objected to um, what Peter Dutton was doing to um, undermine the safety net that existed. Um, so. Um, you know, we're hopeful that if this issue can get sufficient attention um, and can be put to the, the top of the priority list, that change is possible, you know, which is why we're putting so much effort into, into this advocacy. Thank you, Paul. Um, if there's no other questions, we will finalise. Just um, one final reminder to please have a look at those two links, um, as Paul said, to email your MP to bring this issue that sadly has really not received the attention that it needs to the attention of your local MP. Chloe, maybe you could pop that down the bottom so it's handy for them. Um, and also we very much appreciate any uh, support you can give us. And just a reminder that it's doubled right now. And thank you so much for the people that have made that possible. Um, and thank you to the speakers, Yasser, Rebecca and Paul, and most importantly to all of you for spending your time here um, learning about this issue and um, maybe taking some action. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a great night. Sorry, I just saw someone type. Um, I saw a link for a campaign promoting a $9,000 match funding. Can you talk about that? Um, that is with ethical jobs um, and that's until tomorrow night. Uh, we can. Um, Chloe, would you mind just popping in the link to that in answering that person? Thank you. Thanks all.
Thank you. See you. Good night.